So today um, we are going to talk about very important, I think, um, and fundamental topic um, in ICU uh, mechanical ventilation. All of us um, have taken care of patient uh, on mechanical ventilation and sometimes um, it seems like uncomfortable for some people who didn't, um, um, you know, know mechanical ventilation. Uh, but sometimes, you know, some fundamental knowledge will move people from uncomfortable zone to the more comfortable zone dealing with mechanical ventilation. So, uh, you know, uh, patients who are admitted to the ICU, uh, the key word is organ support. So we usually support organs. And one of the commonest organ we support in the ICU is respiratory system and the lung um, and mechanical ventilation is the most commonly used um, way of support in uh, intensive care. So mastering some of the basics of mechanical ventilation would be great for all of us uh, dealing uh, with those patients. So I titled this lecture mechanical ventilation finding the sweet spot and there is a reason behind um, this title. Uh, we know Mechanical ventilation is a way of support, so we want to get benefit for a patient on mechanical ventilation, but at the same time, there is sometimes uh, detrimental complications. So the sweet spot that uh, I meant, we need to find the balance between that harm and getting the benefit without causing much harm. So that's usually the deal or the judgment that we should have on dealing with patient on mechanical ventilation. And sometimes this is different from patient to patient, and sometimes it's different even on one patient at different times. So sometimes you accept degree of harm in order to get benefits, especially when dealing with patient with ARDS, for example, you might accept like a plateau pressure at the higher side uh, at expense of some oxygenation and that kind of things. And that's why it's all like about that judgment. And that's why um, um, I titled this lecture, Finding the Sweet Spot. So uh, this lecture will be divided into parts. First part, I will try to start the usual start and I uh, will state the harm and um, I will run it by you guys. Uh, complications of uh, mechanical ventilation and then we'll move from that and talk about, I think, which is the middle part of our lecture, which is the most important part of our lecture, um, my universal prescription for patient on mechanical ventilation, um, uh, which is very, I think it's very important and helpful for people who didn't know uh, mechanical ventilation before. And we will conclude uh, our lecture with a case uh, scenario and, and um, you know hopefully uh, everyone will get the benefit uh, from this lecture so before I um, uh, start talking about the complications uh, anybody could like tell us about um, what are the complications of mechanical ventilation that you can think of pneumothorax yeah excellent you may get an infection from infection which is VAP, ventilation street pneumonia, which is uh, one of the very common, um, you know, things that we need to prevent, like, uh, in patient. And we take, like, protocols, raising patient bed to, like, 30 degrees and different protocols. Uh, any other? Uh, Bert Roma. Okay, this is includes pneumothorax and, you know, pneumomedestinum and others. Any other complications? Okay. Um, now... You will see the slides like handwritten. So most of the slides will be like combination of these things. It's not like fancy slides. Um, complication of mechanical ventilation. I think every organ is going to be affected uh, with mechanical ventilation. I'm not going to spend much time here because we want to use our time in more part, uh, important part of our lecture. But the main thing is the complication on the lung, uh, which we have under uh, the term V-I-L-I, um, this is um, what we call ventilation-induced lung injury. This is a very famous uh, term. 
Um, and it's like, uh, like you said, first we need to avoid the bar trauma. And the bar trauma, that means you deliver, we deliver positive pressure ventilation. So normally, we, our normal physiological breathing is negative pressure ventilation. Like you take deep breath, negative intrapleural pressure, and the air is sucked in. But the way we provide mechanical ventilation is a positive pressure. So you push air under pressure and you might overdo it. And at that point, you will have the barotrauma and the barotrauma can manifest, like um, Mesa said, pneumothorax, um, pneumomediastinum, surgical emphysemas, and it can be, you know, very serious. The second is we might overdo the volume. You might give very high vol uh, tidal volume and you stretch, you know, the alveoli and this is called volutroma and the volutroma might lead to initially to air trapping, air trapping and O2 peep. Uh, and finally, we again end up in uh, pneumothorax um, and complications because of high pressure indirectly. I will elaborate on that in the next slides. Um, the third is atelectroma. trauma. Atelic trauma, that means if you, for example, um, um, fill the alveoli to the maximum and then completely, um, you know, evacuate or empty the uh, alveoli of air, that will be like distended alveoli all the way and then collapse all the way. Distended all the way, collapse. And this is will lead to like uh, atelic trauma and that will lead to secretion of, you know, uh, of inflammatory mediators and also the biotrauma, which is like combination of both. You will have this uh, like dynamic collapse and hyperinflation. And that's why we aim not to evacuate the alveoli to that degree. And that's why we always talk about what's known as PEEP, which is positive end expiratory pressure that keeps the alveoli with a certain degree of, you know, uh, inflation that prevent this atelic trauma. Um, so these are the big, uh, I mean, uh, complication in addition to what Frank said, um, VAB, ventilation associated pneumonia. And then there are a lot of other uh, complication. I, I'm not going to spend time on this, but one of them is the cardiovascular because it's very related to our lecture. You know, if you overdo it, you, you know, if a patient has much pressure, much volume inside the lung, that means um, intrathoracic pressure is going to be very positive. And you know, the heart is inside the uh, intrathoracic pressure, the heart is going to be squeezed, is going to be positive, and the venous return to the right side is going to be affected. That will lead to low cardiac output. And this is why we usually uh, want to limit the PEEP and, and, and this common scenario of hypotension and shock and it sometimes it will lead to even uh, PEA arrest in a specific scenario like uh, I will explain later so this is you know uh, that's why uh, you know we call it like the sweet spot we need to prevent or limit these complications by our setting and at the same time we want to get the maximum benefit of mechanical ventilation now I after we stating stated the heart so let's go for the benefit. And uh, starting for the benefit, I wanna ask one question, which is a very common question. I, uh, you know, what are the indications for mechanical ventilation? Anybody can like mention some of the indications? Airway protection. Like what are they? Yeah, airway protection. Airway protection for a patient with a Glasgow coma less than eight. This is like very common uh, indication. Any other? Excellent, because the lung, like lung respiratory failure means either failure of oxygenation or failure of ventilation. These are the big. Ventilation is the wash of CO2. If the patient cannot do that, we would support him. Um, hypoxia, which is very common. Uh, if patient cannot um, oxygenate himself, we will support him. The other is like protection of airway against infection and aspiration. These are the common, but one of the things that we might do like elective intubation and mechanical ventilation is that, you know, increase work of breathing. And when you uh, want to rest the lung, for example, in very severe asthma, uh, you just intubate to give the patient uh, rest for some time until the asthma breaks. Um, so these are the common other is the, you know, severe shock, like two pressure shock. We usually intubate people, uh, but I will approach it now 
a different way. And, and now, I think this is one of the important parts of our lectures. So I would say, if I intubate somebody and connected him to the mechanical ventilation, my question is why? Why we are intubating this patient and uh, ventilating him? So the question will fall into one of two categories. Are we intubating patient for restrictive lung disease, the common disease that lead to lung injury? Like the extreme of it is the ARDS, but it can start with pneumonia, it can start with pulmonary edema, all others like these kind of diseases that lead to acute lung injury. These are like the disease that lead mainly of uh, defect of oxygenation and might end in ARDS. So this is one category. All of other like uh, category, all of other disease are except asthma and COPD, as you know. Asthma and COPD, they have different physiology and different pathophysiology, and those people have defective ventilation, and they have what's known as obstructive airway disease. And knowing the difference between these two uh, big categories is a key to understanding the initial setting, at least, and dealing with mechanical ventilation. So this is my big question. If I am ventilating patient for bronchial asthma, for example, I would go for my uh, like prescription, which is I memorize for asthma. There is nuances, there is a small differences, but overall that setting is gonna be the same. If not asthma or COPD, I'm gonna do the common, you know, airway protection strategy, okay? So those people usually have defective oxygenation, but those people usually they oxygenate fine. They have problem with CO2 retention. And again, this is important and a big difference. So what are these two differences? So what are these two strategies? Now, for the sake of time and for the sake of discussion in, uh, in our lecture today, I'm gonna talk about the obstructive strategy because I felt it's, it's more doable and it's, it's more important because it's like tricky and unique. But, um, you know, I just, uh, I don't want to spend much time on the restrictive or lung injury part of um, the discussion, ARDS, I mean, we can cover this uh, in a future like uh, presentation, but this is, you know, f um, our uh, initial setting for a patient uh, with uh, ARDS or lung injury, pneumonias, pulmonary edemas, whatever. Now, this is the other strategy and it's our topic. So say, for example, you have female 40 year old uh, presented with um, asthma exacerbation in the ED and the patient ha was tachypneic, you know, um, short of breath, desatting. You started your nebulizers, um, steroids, uh, magnesium, um, no response, patient still like tachypneic and then you started the BiBAP, um, give some sedation, but the patient still, um, you know, um, exhausted. And you decided to intubate this patient in the ED or maybe in the ICU. And then now, you know, this is an asthma. So our discussion would be like an asthma because there's the classic obstruction, usually with asthma, there is a very small difference with the COPD that I will talk later about later, but now let's stick for asthmatic patient with severe bronchospasm who needed intubation and they reach it to that point, okay? So before I start explaining this, I just wanted to ask you guys, what do you think going on with asthmatic patient and COPD, of course, uh, and you, what, what, what do you want to reverse? What's the bad physiology? And what do you want to reverse on those people? What's your aim? You're trying to maximize ventilation, so you're trying to uh, push out more CO2 that you have control over with the ventilation and sedation. Excellent. So you want to ventilate those people because classically the ABG with asthmatic patients usually have like type 2 respiratory failure, which is acute type 2, high CO2. It's not usually oxygenation with asthma, right? So it's usually the ventilation and um, how you're gonna like is there any other goal for asthma how you're gonna achieve this ventilation they have air trapping so I excellent think that's why we need to uh, set it to increase the expiration excellent more than like inspiration 
Excellent. This is one of the most important and fundamental points regarding um, ventilating patient. Before I, I come to this, let me just explain what's going on with asthma and understanding that will make you, you know, um, um, set the ventilation the proper way that it should be. So in patient with asthma, like um, uh, Frank and Mesa said, patient with asthma, they have obstructive airway disease. Before I explain this, I need to talk about three pressures, and you have heard about them, all of three of them. Peak pressure, plateau pressure, and peak. Let me talk about them, and then I will explain asthma. So what's peak pressure? So if somebody like, um, what's peak pressure? Can anybody just um, explain the concept of peak pressure? And what's it all about? Okay. Mm -hmm. So that that yeah. So so yeah. So so the peak pressure is a dynamic pressure. So if the air is moving in, if the air is moving in, it's gonna be met with resistance, right? So the air is moving. So all the way. Oops. Sorry. So all the way, the air is gonna be met with resistance, and this resistance is the airway resistance, um, either in or out. Okay, so the airway resistance uh, needs, you know, a pressure to overcome this. The higher the resistance, the higher the pressure needed to push the air in or out. And this airway resistance, we have a lot, we can measure resistance, but peak pressure is the reflection of that resistance. So it's a dynamic pressure uh, and reflects the resistance that the air faces while uh, moving in and out of the lung. So moving in the lung or out of the lung. So if a patient, for example, biting the tube, like patient uh, not sedated well and biting, if there is a mucus plug, if there is like bronchoconstriction, bronchospasm, all of this is going to increase the airway resistance. So peak pressure is linked to airway resistance. And this is very important. If I find somebody who has very high peak, which is more than uh, 35, um, sometimes we accept 40. Um, so that would be very high. And I, I usually think in a way that there may be mu mucus blood, there may be the patient biting the tube, uh, you know, these kind of things. I auscultate looking for any wheeze. Um, so peak pressure is high. So this is number one. Second. I just want to confirm. So peak pr pressure is the pressure required to overcome any sort of resistance. Yeah. That's that, right? Yeah. Resistance in the endotracheal tube, resistant in the, you know, because you eliminate all of the, you know, up, um, upper airway resistance by the tube. And that's why in asthma, we usually, if you intubate somebody, you aim for 7.5 tube, right? Intubation usually. But in asthma, we usually... Uh, aim for like 8, 8.5. So people with obstructive airway disease, we wanted bigger size tube to re reduce this because airway resistance is the main pathophysiology in those people. Um, so the second pressure is the pressure. So if the air goes in and the patient at the end of inspiration, the air is going to fill this alveolus and is going to be distributed. And that's a static pressure like at the end. And the way we check it in the ventilation, at the end of inspiration, we do like 0.5 inspiratory hold. Like there's a dial, you, you just um, uh, you know, press on this, you will find that plateau pressure. So what's the plateau pressure? Is the pressure at the end of inspiration um, in the alveoli. Uh, that reflects the um, compliance. So this is another term. So compliance means static pressure, the plateau pressure, and it's usually end inspiratory. So the way I think about compliance, I would give the example of if I have a balloon and I have like a bag, it's easy to inflate a bag, no much pressure, the, the bag is very highly compliant. That means I don't need much plateau pressure to open this bag or inflate this bag. But if I have a balloon, I need to, you have to, to spend some effort in order to inflate that so the balloon is, is less compliant than the bag. And normally the lung behaves like a balloon, right? So there is some, um, you know, compliance and that's 
um, the plateau pressure um, at the end of inspiration. So the plateau pressure, we have some plateau, which we accept like 30, 35 of plateau. Uh, so 35 of plateau pressure, that means the compliance is, um, you know, accepted. If there is any increase in plateau pressure, that means the, the alveoli is not compliant. That means it's not inflating like ARDS, which is very common, like uh, lung fibrosis. And that's why you see this strategy, like obstructive, they have high peak. Sometimes they will have high plateau if over inflated, but it's mainly like peak pressure and resistance. People with ARDS in the other extreme and other lung injury disease, they usually have a high plateau pressure and less compliance. And that's why these are the different aims. And then those people like the ARDS that will affect oxygenation because it's all the way down in the uh, airway, but obstructive disease usually will affect it by, they will affect like uh, ventilation and CO2 uh, because of like they cannot blow the air out of the lung. Anyway, I will elaborate on this. So this is plateau pressure. So when I say plateau, that's what I mean by plateau. And then the, normally the patient or the person exhale all the way out and all the way out, as I said, we don't want the collapse, right? And there is some degree of pressure at the end of expiration that's called PEEP, positive end expiratory pressure that stint open the airway at the end of expiration and that will help in prevention of collapse and the next cycle is gonna be less, um, you know, uh, the work of breathing is gonna be um, um, less and easier for the patient to, uh, to take the next uh, breathing. So the PEEP is the pressure at the end of expiration that maintains stint open the airway. Some degree of PEEP, yes, we need some degree of PEEP, say for example, five, but uh, too much PEEP. So if we have too much PEEP, that means we have high intrathrust pressure and PEEP is part of plateau in general and the high PEEP will be reflected on high plateau on inspiration and that's why we don't want high PEEP. So what's the negative impact of high PEEP? If a patient has air trapping, uh, they cannot expel air out so they will have like high PEEP and this high PEEP is gonna lead to positive intrathoracic pressure and this positive intrathoracic pressure like I said is gonna lead to hypo uh, tension and shock because of reduced venous return and in severe form it can lead to cardio um, cardiac arrest or PEA arrest. So what happened in patient with asthma in general? So patient with asthma has very high airway resistance. So those people have very high airway resistance and that's because of secretions and bronchospasm. So secretions, bronchospasm and they have very high airway resistance. So the airway resistance usually overcome during inspiration. And the reason why, because inspiration is an active process. You, you know, you contract muscles, you contract diaphragm. So you overcome the, the airway resistance to some degree during inspiration. But the expiration is a passive pressure. You know, we just, you know, uh, at the end of inspiration, elastic recoil of the lung is all what we need for passive expiration. And that's why the main problem with those people with asthma is not during taking uh, breath, the problem is during expiration because they need to, to work for breathing and that's why you see the work of breathing in those people. So that increase in resistance will lead to decreased expiration of air. And that decrease in expiration in air is gonna lead for at the end of expiration, there is residual, more residual air at the end of expiration. And that residual air is gonna be um, uh, accumulated like breath by breath to the next breath. You take much air, you exhale less amount. And progressively, you're gonna have like the hyperinflation. That decrease in expiration will lead to high, uh, or oh, what's, what's known as air trapping. So like, like um, Mesa said, air trapping is the main thing in those people. So air trapping will lead to, say for example, more air, that will lead to increased PEEP, right? So the PEEP is gonna be up. But this PEEP, we don't set this PEEP. This is PEEP that they have, and we call it auto PEEP. And this is the term for auto PEEP. The more air trapping, the more auto PEEP. So more auto PEEP. 
So this auto peep is one of the keys when I set mechanical ventilation for a patient with asthma, high auto peep, that means there will be um, increased intrathoracic pressure uh, and there will be a decrease in venous return and that decrease in venous return is gonna lead to low, you know, uh, blood pressure and in severe form PEA arrest. But the, the point is this auto peep will lead also to barotrauma, right? So barotrauma, pneumothorax. So if you overdo it, if you give high tidal volume, high pressure on those people, the patient is gonna end up uh, 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 having pneumothorax. So they have very, um, you know, low threshold of developing like barotrauma. So what are we doing to break this cycle? And like in short, what do you think guys we should do to break this cycle? Excellent. So short inspiration and long expiration. How you are going to do that? IE ratio. And is there any other way for doing this? Like slow, slow respiratory rate, like low respiratory rate. So the aim is to start the most effective way. So let's, let's say we wanted to help them exhale. This is a key word. This is a key word. So forget about all of this. If you wanted to ventilate asthmatic patient, you should help them exhale. This is our aim, okay? Now, how can we achieve this? That's the question now. What's the very effective, like the first line, any change in that is gonna have very big effects, positive or negative? And what's the second line that might have some beneficial effects? What do you think? So first, we talked about respiratory rate, right? Said, said the lowest peep, because they have already auto peep, so low peep. Excellent, okay. Okay, excellent. So, say for example, now this, let's, let's now go back to the strategy. So the mode is gonna be VCV. I will explain this mode. But then the most important is this, which is the respiratory rate, okay? So this is a key on ventilating asthmatic patient. If I want to set, I want to aim for the lowest respiratory rate. And again, you need to, um, you know, um, assist the patient for ventilation. Like Frank said, CO2 and ventilation on one side. And at the same time, I wanted to aim for the lowest respiratory rate. So usually numbers are different, but I would, for example, start with 10 and go up slowly like 12 and see how the response, I will explain that. So first I need lower respiratory rate. Why is that? So in VCV, say for example, these are the VCV cycles. Okay, so we have like, this is one second and third breath. Say, for example, I set the respiratory rate um, at, say, 15 for the ease of calculation, okay? So that means every four seconds, I'm going to have a new um, mechanical breath. So the distance from here to here is four seconds, okay? And this four seconds is, um, I'm sorry, it's the distance from here to here is going to be four seconds. So it's inspiration and expiration. The total cycle is going to be four seconds. And now, every time you have one breathing, so you have five, uh, sorry, four seconds. And these four seconds, you set something called IE ratio. You know the IE ratio? So the lower the respiratory rate, usually the more time for expiration. I, this is, so for example, I said this is for one second and I set this for three seconds. So I will have like one second during inspiration and three seconds, so this is one to three. And I can aim even for one to four and even one to five. Every time I prolong this expiratory time and slowing the respiratory rate, that's the, um, the best um, and, and the first line in dealing with um, this air trapping. So IE ratio, and lower respiratory rate. So lower respiratory rate, high IE ratio. The second thing, which is the tidal volume. 
So the tidal volume I need to balance between not overdoing it, but not hypoventilating the patient. An asthmatic patient, usually they have, uh, you know, high dead space. And I would start with six liters and see how the patient is ventilating. So usually uh, six to eight, uh, like CC per kg, uh, you know, uh, ideal body weight. This is the, it's, it's ideal to start with this and then check for CO2 and uh, ABG or uh, if you have capnography on the screen. So this is tidal volume and respiratory rate. And then there's a secondary measures that can affect and give you some benefit, which is the inspiratory flow rate. How fast do you want the air to get in? So the faster, the less the duration of uh, inspiration. So usually we set this at 50 to 60, normally, if anybody other than them, like obstructive physiologies. But if a patient has obstructive physiology, we set it usually at 80. And this is one of the dial on the mechanical ventilation that you can increase the inspiratory flow. That means faster inspiration and every time, so the cycle is four seconds. If you shorten inspiration, all of the other time is gonna be added to the expiration. So this is another way to prolong expiration. So slow respiratory rate, IE ratio, um, uh, speed, the uh, flow rate as a secondary measure is not very uh, highly effective, but this is one of the things. And then FiO2, there's no problem with oxygenation. If asthmatic patient has problem with oxygenation, think of other pathology like pneumonias or whatever. Uh, but again, we talk about the PEEP. The PEEP is a big controversial uh, point in asthma. I don't want to confuse uh, everybody about it, but you can set the PEEP at zero and you are right and you have people support you. And you can go like fancy and ask a question. Is a patient passive on a ventilation, like knocked down, which is our aim for uh, asthmatic patient, especially in the first four or five hours, as I explained, that if a patient, ha, you know, like passive on the ventilation, you can set the PEEP like 75% of what's known as OTOP. So if you dial expiratory hole, like the PEEP is expiratory hole, and you will have the number of OTOP. Say, for example, the OTOP 8, and you take 80% of this number and you just set it. Like, for example, 6. This is if the patient like passive, but if the patient like war, you know, triggering the ventilation later, you can sit at zero and you can sit at five. And this is, can be explained and, you know, in, in a different way. I think it's beyond the time of this lecture, but it's all about triggering ventilation and helping patient to take breath. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so generally speaking, are the, um, um, so let me go for, for this. So, I have a patient who has asthma, reach it to the point. So you tell me, how to set, how much you want the tidal volume? You tell me. Like the patient ideal body weight is 65, oh 60. Okay, uh, let's, let's 360 start with this and then we'll see, check the CO2. How much the respiratory rate that you want? 10. 10, 11, whatever. Okay, let's start with 10. And what's the IE ratio? 1 to 4, 1 to 5, right? And what's the inspiratory flow rate, which is usually 50, but eight, we eight can eight, like speed it up. Okay, so this is 80, like liter per minute, okay? And the FI2, we usually start with 100 and we usually reduce it to 40 like in one hour. Oxygenation is not a problem. And then the PEEP. What do you think the PEEP? You need to think. If you want to be simple, just set it at 5. If you want to be fancy, think about these things and this is beyond our time. And then you, did, you, 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 you set this and then one thing, you want it to see. So the ventilation, this is the doctor, this is us. And this is the patient. So everything we do on this screen is gonna be reflected on that side, okay? So the tidal volume, the patient is taking 350. 
uh, or uh, let's say if it's 70, which is good. So the thing that you said. And then the respiratory rate, the patient is breathing. So this is 10 and the mood is ACVC. You know what's the meaning of this? So ACVC means if you set the rate at 12, the patient is not going to have less than 12. 10, the patient is not going to have less than 10, but he can have more. And that's why, say, for example, I saw the patient taking like 20. I would say, okay, I set the respiratory rate at 10, and the patient is taking spontaneously. What do you think, Jen, the next step? So you, you like um, ventilating patient with asthma, and you will find... Excellent, excellent. So we need just to sedate this patient because we wanted to rest the lung. And that's why in asthma, you need to knock down the patient uh, like with a deep sedation, ketamine or whatever. So this is one of the things. So now after sedation, Jen uh, like started uh, uh, ketamine, barofol, whatever accordingly. And the patient now is 10. And the FI2 is okay. The peak pressure was 40, sorry for, I, I, I know I, I went beyond the time. And the plateau, uh, I don't want to prolong the discussion. I will make it like known, 25, okay? So what do you think now? The peak is 40, maybe even 50. I wouldn't look for the peak in asthmatic patient with this, you know, especially if the chest is wheezy. I would ignore it. I would go with the plateau. As far as the plateau 25, it's okay. Say, for example, the plateau 35. So this is too much and there is risk for... Uh, lung injury at this point I need to change something and now the sweet spot reduce tidal volume reduce the peep try to make this number less than 30 so this is I think generally the the the, the strategy for doing this let me go to the uh, this one yeah so what do you think about the like I wouldn't choose these or maybe I wouldn't think about it in this way because the management sedation would be 3.6. This is a very excellent question. So uh, that would like... This is a very excellent question. That's why I, I'm, I'm, I'm not happy about this lecture because I didn't pass this message again. So we wanted to ventilate those people because the CO2 is going to be high, right? So okay. asthma, you start with a CO2 like of 70, 65, right? And then I come, I see like 360 is not good ventilation, minute volume is gonna be low, right? right. Now, this is the, you know, the judgment. Should I accept CO2 or risk giving higher numbers? The answer is you aim for the pH, not the CO2. So for example, I would accept sometimes in extreme cases, and I had it at some time, accept CO2 like 100, as far as the pH above 7.2. There is no study behind that. Everybody use random number for the pH, but I will run it by a pH. Permissive hypercapnia, right? The permissive hypercapnia. So I would go with this setting as far as the pH above 7.2. Some say like 7.1 in young asthmatic. So say, for example, pH is 7.2, CO2 is handled. I'm happy because the patient of asthma is not going to die because of hypercapnia. Hypercapnia is not a killer. It's, um, I would be worried about hypercapnia in two situations. High intracranial pressure, and you know about that, brain edema, and pulmonary hypertension with severely um, affected right ventricular uh, function because the CO2 is going to increase the afterload in those people. In these two situations, I would be worried about the CO2, and I need to uh, get it down. Otherwise, I'm happy. And sometimes they say pregnant female because it might affect the baby. Uh, apart from these big two situation and maybe pregnancy, I would be happy with CO2 even handled. And some papers say even 200. CO2 is not a killer. Okay, is that, is that make sense? So aim for the, the, the pH. And if you need it, so the CO2 cannot be managed and the pH come to the point like seven, you can give sodium bicarb. And the sodium bicarb, again, there is a big discussion. Sodium bicarb is gonna com be converted to CO2 and you are worsening things. But there is another discussion that, you know, um, says another things and another theory behind it. But sodium bicarb, I will go for it in extreme case. In case I can't manage this, the pH and the CO2 is still not ventilated. 
take home message, we are not washing the CO2 in asthmatic. The reason why we intubate it is to risk the lung and giving treatment and waiting for asthma to break. When the asthma breaks, everything will be okay. It, it's gonna be like very quick, right? Any questions? Okay, thank, thank you guys. Sir. Thanks. Right. Very good. Thing and this. Sorry, um, um, you know, I have to skip many things. I give you this case, I conclude our uh, lecture. So, 40 year old female uh, with a bronchial asthma presented to the ED. She received the package for the asthma. Um, and then she's still having like respiratory rate of 30. She's still anxious and she has severe bronchospasm. We connected uh, the patient on the BiBAP and she has Presidex for sedation, but unfortunately no improvement. Now, rapid sequence or delayed sequence intubation with ketamine, rock, fentanyl. The patient is connected to VCV, like, uh, you know, a mechanic of his six, uh, tidal volume 14, respiratory rate FI2 of 100 and PEEP of five, okay? And we know why we set these. Maybe respiratory rate is uh, higher. Maybe you, you aim to reduce it, these kind of things, IE ratio and everything. And then shortly after, the nurse called you and the patient was uh, saturating 80% after she was 100% and struggling and also the blood pressure dropped to 85. She's shocked with MAP of 50. My question, you know the patient has asthma, you're taking care of this patient and this patient suddenly collapsed in front of your eyes and in this scenario, what's your response? Calculate the plateau pressure. There's no time for plateau pressure. Oh, no. Chest x-ray, just like yeah. or something. Excellent. Uh, okay, uh, chest x-ray. But what's the action that you should you take? Just take a listen to them, see if the sounds on the side. Okay, excellent. What do you call it? If we are suspecting, uh, what do you call it? Large pneumothorax. Tension pneumothorax, you can just uh, uh, put a needle in. Excellent. Uh, uh, so what's the first step? That, that's why I mentioned this scenario. There's one thing that saved life. And this patient is gonna go and PAA arrest, right? So let's think, what's going on? Why the blood pressure is low? Pneumothorax is one possibility, right? Second, do you remember the air trapping? Yeah. Do you know, you know, 14 respiratory rate, tidal volume. Increasing intrathoracic pressure. Could be, could be. Yeah. It could be like too much o 2 right? Patient has severe, Okay, so this patient could have either pneumothorax or could have too much o 2 peep and it could be like during ventilation, we don't bag. You know, we have like the intuition to do a bag and then in, in asthma and COPD, try to minimize this because it's, it's gonna lead to these things. So no bagging, this is the, the take home message for this, but now what's the action based on this information? Pneumothorax? I'm gonna get the ultrasound or like check the chest X-ray, do the needle, ask auscultate for the absent. But the most important, how you get rid of this O2P? Stop the ventilation. Excellent, excellent. <laughs> Disconnect the patient. So this is a very important scenario. Asthma patient being ventilated, shocked, hypoxic, could be pneumothorax. Yes, disconnect your patient. So disconnect the patient, you save life. This is very, very important, um, I mean, scenario in asthma. So this step is, like, if you want to look at the ventilation and confirm your diagnosis, okay? This is the curve. So the only curve that I will look for in asthmatic patient is the flow curve. And, and if you see, this is the, the dotted is the normal. Normally, this is inspiration and this is expiration. This point, at the end of expiration, there should be no air. And the other is asthmatic patient with severe bronchospasm. Look at the end of expiration, finished, but there is air. And this air trapping corresponding to O2P. So I, if I would look for something, I would look to the screen for this, you know, the pressure, the volume, and the flow, the flow, and go for this finding. If those people does not 
um, return back to the baseline during expiration and hypotensive, that's confirmatory um, like um, a sign and you have to disconnect your patient. So how to confirm? Looking at the screen and like you can argue this is a uh, dynamic hyperinflation and air strapping. So action. Disconnect patient from mechanical ventilation, ultrasound, like you said, uh, or chest X-ray, a needle maybe or something. So I think if you, from this lecture, I know it's very uh, long topic. I try to uh, to squeeze it, but one thing, take home message: asthmatic patient with the optimal setting, you think hypo uh, hypoxia, hypotension, you prevent PAA. Usually, it's not VTAC, VFib. It's not shockable. It's not non-shockable side because of severe hypoxia, you prevent that by disconnected those patients and you confirm that by looking at the screen and the expiratory flow curve does not reach the baseline. Um, I come to uh, end of this lecture and thank you for your time. Uh, sorry for going beyond that.